Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, at least for 15 more minutes. Thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, we're here to talk about the Paycheck Protection Program, which is Title I of the CARES Act, which was just signed into law on Friday. I have uh, Mark Kamisic uh, and uh, Mike Van Summeren with me uh, from the firm, and we'll all be uh, uh, chiming in as, uh, as appropriate uh, during the presentation. Uh, you all were kind enough to send a number of questions along in advance uh, when you signed up, and we will be uh, able to address a number of those uh, as the presentation goes on. So thanks again for being with us. The Paycheck Protection Program, uh, which has been the subject of a lot of discussion over the last uh, week plus, uh, I'm sure uh, any number of you have seen uh, a variety of resources that are available on this, um, but it does uh, uh, create uh, an incentive for small businesses to keep workers on their payroll uh, it will be administered by the SBA, uh, and that will be through uh, local lenders. There are going to be other lenders that will be deputized uh, as the process begins that are not traditional SBA lenders that will be able to be involved in the process, uh, although we're not certain that they'll come online fast enough uh, to take advantage of the resources, which we understand uh, will, will likely uh, be fully, uh, fully applied for uh, perhaps in as soon as something like 10 days. Uh, so we certainly recommend that if you are working with a bank already and they're an SBA lender that you All stay with them. are now yeah. interactive talk mode. Some substantiation because I'm going to, we're going to have to have this conversation with bankers perhaps. Um, but I All participants are now in listen only mode. the big key ultimately the loan will be forgiven uh, or a portion of it will be forgiven uh, at the conclusion of the of the loan period uh, and there's a process for that and we'll get to that uh, shortly so the fundamental question is who is eligible uh, and the principal demarcation is employers with fewer than 500 employees uh, Entities that would not ordinarily be eligible to participate in 7As, like 501c3s, uh, are now, for these purposes, uh, able to participate. Uh, we've had some questions as to whether uh, 501c6s uh, are eligible, and uh, unfortunately, they are not. Um, and then, as you see on the list, uh, independent contractors, sole proprietors, and others uh, are also uh, uh, eligible. Uh, the, the SBA issued guidance recently uh, that indicates uh, that there are two application periods. So starting tomorrow, uh, tomorrow the third, uh, small businesses uh, and sole proprietors can apply. Uh, and then they're staggering this so that on April 10th, uh, independent contractors and self-employed individuals, individuals uh, can apply at that point. Uh, hopefully the staggered start doesn't leave that second category of folks uh, scrambling for, uh, even though it's $349 billion, but for what we might uh, consider uh, limited resources. Um, Larry, just to chime in here, this is Mike Van Summeren. Um, Larry, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Um, just so everybody's aware, the this is the start date. Um, what we are hearing anecdotally is that it's going to, that there's going to be a rush. It's supposed to be available at 12.01 a.m. tomorrow. Um, whether that will actually happen, there's some concerns there um, because of course this program is going very quickly. Um, so that way, you know, just wanna make sure everybody's aware that there very well could be some glitches, um, but you know, in a perfect world, if you get your application in which it can be done all online is my understanding. The application form is is supposed to be completely online. Things are supposed to be able to be done electronically. Um, the goal is to be able to have money out the door by the end of the day, if if everything goes well. And Mark, I believe you're on the line now. Do you want to introduce yourself quick before we get too too much further into the program? I am. Um, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today uh, to talk about the uh, paycheck protection program and um, kind of what I call a jigsaw puzzle that um, we're trying to put together as more guidance is dripped out 
from the IRS, the Treasury, um, the Department of Labor, and other um, sources. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, it's a you know it's a very uh, important program you know with an incentive to uh, keep people on payroll. Yes, and that should be one of the things that we're going to discuss is you know the purpose of this program is to keep people on payrolls and off unemployment rolls. So that is the goal of this program. Um, that you know, so keep that in mind as with some of your questions coming in regarding what what the uses of the funds can be. You know, when do you have to hire people? Do you need to hire people? Can you fire? Um, the overarching purpose is going to be uh, something that's going to that should be in the back of your mind as you are making your decisions because that's going to inform some of the answers. So. Um, we just went over the who is eligible. Um, so, Larry, if you want to go to the next slide, we can start del diving into what some of this means as far as eligibility and who these entities are and what some of the requirements actually are when you get into the weeds. Sure. So the so Larry, uh, go ahead, Mike. Oh, I was just gonna I was just gonna say, Larry, we talked about it's 500 employees or less. What are some of the nuances there? Right, so uh, the, the big exception to the 500 employee rule has to do with uh, NAICS code 72 uh, uh, originating uh, entities. So as you see here, uh, we're talking about food service and accommodation uh, businesses, hotels, restaurants, uh, the uh, NAICS codes are readily available and there are roughly 20 designations under this 72 category. Um, as we've all seen, uh, those, uh, those uh, sectors of the business world have been impacted uh, incredibly uh, immediately already by, uh, by what's going on here. And so uh, it, to the extent that they have uh, less than 500 employees per location, so per hotel location, uh, restaurant, et cetera, um, they will qualify as an exception to the SBA affiliation rules. Uh, and that's rather important uh, for that industry. Uh, there has also been a waiver for franchise operators. Uh, again, uh, also very important. Uh, what, what this does do is leave uh, a lot of businesses uh, wondering whether if they have more than 500 uh, in the aggregate, but perhaps separated out in different, in different corporate forms, uh, either with some sort of umbrella organization over top of them or side by side uh, with them, uh, whether they're gonna run afoul of the affiliation rules uh, that the SBA has and, uh, and not qualify for the program. Uh, I, there is uh, some guidance that the, well, certainly the SBA has, has statutes that talk about affiliation uh, and we will make available uh, after the, uh, webinar, uh, some resources uh, that have links to different, different, different additional resources, including uh, an overview of affiliation. Uh, but in general, uh, things like stock ownership and 50% and uh, or more of the voting stock or control of less than 50% of the stock, but a larger share compared to others uh, and things of that sort, uh, are going to impact uh, affiliation and, and lead to a determination that, that entities are affiliated. Uh, similarly, uh, items like uh, whether things are, uh, whether entities are commonly managed uh, come into play. Uh, the identity of interest between individuals uh, or businesses, including family members, uh, also comes into play. And then the general category of contractual relationships or economic dependency, um, again, figures into figures into this. Uh, so we think that there's going to be, at least for the folks that are butting up against the limit, uh, there's going to be a, a lot of, a lot of uh, analysis that needs to be done uh, so folks don't run afoul of the affiliation rules. Uh, and then uh, our last point on this screen, as we say, is that uh, full part-time and other status employees all count uh, for the purposes of the, of the 500 number uh, under the Paycheck Protection Program or the PPP. Thanks, Larry. Um, just so we're getting a lot of questions regarding the affiliation rules. Um, 
like Larry had said, the common, de- common denominators are looking for common control. Um, and so it's going to be a very facts and circumstances based test. Also with the speed that, with which this program is going to operate and it's designed to operate, um, affiliations are going to be difficult to determine quickly. Uh, so, you know, this is a complete, this is a complete speculation on our part, but there's a chance that they may try to rectify this going back and just not allow for forgiveness. But we, we really can't tell at this point how they're going to approach this. I don't think that they understand, they being the SBA understands how it's going to be approached. Um, you know, one of the things to keep in mind is a lot of franchise models, especially in the food industry, where they would, where those would typically be affiliated entities because they also will likely fall under that 72 category of the NAICS. You're going to be able to get coverage for each location. So even if you were a single employer, you would have you would be able to average your wages, or your I'm sorry, your size limit would be based on per location, employees per location. So that is something to keep in mind as as you start looking at your affiliation, whether you even need to go down the rabbit hole of affiliation. If you fall under the NAICS 72 category, uh, affiliation is going to be less of a problem for you. I'll just add one one more thing to the discussion, Mike uh, and Larry, and that not really talking about the affiliation, but talking about um, which employees are considered um, employees for purposes of the 500 or fewer threshold. The, there has been questions about um, whether or not uh, leased employees under a uh, leased employee agreement are also considered employees. The answer is yes. Um, so employees also include leased employees. Um, while we're on eligibility, we've got two questions that we kind of glossed over. Um, there is a different calculation for seasonal employers. There's a shorter window for calculating uh, the the number of employee or your, your payroll expenses, and you'll see that going forward. So the short answer is seasonal employers are eligible for this program. Um, the next point when we get to talking about loan size and how they size the loans available and the funds available, you'll see that there's a different period to more accurately capture what your payroll costs actually are. And the other question we had, and Larry, I'm going to defer to you and Mark on this, um, whether a 501c4 is eligible for this program. Um, My understanding is that they are not. The the regs call out specifically 501c3s and 501c19s for this program. Yeah, my understanding is that it's exclusively just um, carved out 501c3. And so, you know, social welfare organizations um, or local associations of employee under 501c4, um, as of right now, are um, based on our interpretation, are not eligible employers. And 501C19s, which are veteran, certain veterans organizations, I believe, are also eligible under this program. They are. So next, let's get to the what the what these what this program looks like and what the loan terms are. Larry, you want to carry us through this? Sure. So uh, the the law, as written, uh, talked about an, uh, an, a term of up to ten years for the loans. Um, and talked about uh, an interest rate of up to 4% for the loans. Uh, Further guidance issued from the SBA uh, within the last few days uh, that indicates that the loan term is going to be for two years uh, and that payments will be, and and, uh, well, that the loan term is going to be for two years and that the interest rate is going to be uh, at just one one half of 1% um, for all applicants. So that overrides what the, uh, the, the law said itself. Uh, and uh, there is a deferral component that uh, exists here. Uh, and again, uh, even though there's, there's flex, there appeared to be some flexibility with that, uh, again, it looks as though they're trying to make everything uniform. And so the payment deferral will be for six months. Uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the... Uh, at the end of the, well, the program runs through, the, the, the program runs through June 30th in terms of the forgivability determination 
sort of the, the and, and, we'll, and we'll get to that. Um, so I, to the extent that a loan is forgiven at, at that point or within the application process takes 60 days for the lender to approve, but to the extent that it's forgiven, then uh, clearly at that point, there won't be any more term to the loan because it's it's gone. Uh, so the, the two years will come into play or the extra year and a half or a little over that will come into play for those who have all or a portion of the loan that is not uh, eligible for forgivability, uh, but the uh, half percent interest rate will still carry for that period of time. So it's still a remarkably low rate of interest. Uh, and so, you know, really where all the action on this thing is, uh, is on the principal forgiveness uh, aspect of it. Uh, these essentially will convert to grants or at least a portion of them that qualify will convert to grants um, if folks are able to follow the process. So what are qualifying expenses? Uh, essentially, they break down into four different categories, the majority of which will be payroll costs. Uh, and then rent is probably the next most important for folks. Uh, mortgage interest, but not principal payments. And then utilities, uh, which consist of the ordinary uh, uh, water and electricity and that sort of thing, um, but also include uh, telephones uh, and internet service, which uh, clearly are, are important these days. Uh, and then uh, payroll costs themselves have their own definition. Uh, and as you can see, it's a pretty broad category uh, uh, that also includes uh, insurance premiums, uh, wages, right, uh, vacation and, and, and sick pay. Um, and, but there's an important qualifier that maybe Mark uh, can talk about now uh, uh, with regard to the uh, Families First uh, Coronavirus Response Act. Thanks, Larry. So this is where uh, we're talking about putting the pieces of the puzzle together. So um, under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, um, employers are able to, or basically are allowed a non, actually a refundable tax credit um, for qualified leave wages that are paid and qualified sick leave wages that are paid. Um, because you are going to receive that credit under this different act, um, what this legislation has done is it specifically excludes that as payroll costs because they don't want to, they don't want employers to get a double, um, a double credit, so to speak. So um, the way that it works under the Families First Court, you know, Coronavirus Response Act is that if, for example, um, an eligible employer pays $8,000 in qualified sick leave, wages um, and it otherwise has ten thousand dollars worth of um, what, what they deem as a uh, payroll taxes and that actually includes what you normally would be required to deposit for um, the withhold federal income taxes the employer's share of Social Security and Medicare taxes and the employee's share of Medi um, Medicare and Social Security taxes so at the end of the day, what you're allowed to do is, in that case, in that example, if you pay out 8000 and you're otherwise required to deposit 10000 you're allowed to take a credit against the 10000 you're required to deposit and then only deposit $2,000. So that's how that works in terms of um, the, uh, the advance process. And, you know, another quick example, if you actually paid 10000 but only were required to deposit 8000 um, then you can actually submit a form, and I believe the form is Form 7200, which was just issued last night, um, to actually apply for a uh, basically a refund of that $2,000 difference. So, um, to the extent that you're getting a credit for those qualified sick leave and qualified um, um, leave that that is paid, you know, under the Response Act, it is not considered payroll costs. And to the extent that you actually use some of this loan to pay that, um, that amount would not be eligible to be forgiven. Thanks, Mark. Hey, Larry, can you can you walk people through um, payroll costs and how this applies to the sole proprietor and the self-employed? Uh... And how comp how payroll costs typically run in a or payroll costs also include compensation that in that a self-employed person would collect um even if even if you don't take 
wages per se. Um, that that can be included, and you can pay yourself uh, an average disbursement that you would take during the year up to a hundred up to a hundred thousand dollar a year prorated amount during the covered period, which is March one, twenty twenty, to June thirtieth, twenty twenty. Right. So the so, um, go ahead. No, go ahead. So the uh, uh, SBA, uh, as part when they released the application, they also released two information sheets, one for borrowers and one for lenders. Uh, and that sheet uh, does talk about uh, for sole proprietors and independent contractors that wages, commissions, income, uh, or net earnings from self-employment uh, capped at 100,000, as Mike uh, indicated, uh, on an annualized basis uh, for each employee uh, can count uh, as payroll costs. So that is, uh, that is certainly a little different than uh, a traditional uh, employers. Um, I'm not sure. And so that this there's... is how this is covering. I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is how Please. this is applying to sole proprietors and independent contractors who aren't typically who aren't uh, technically employees of anybody, but they're still eligible uh, to collect a loan, which is based on payroll costs, and also receive money under this program as a qualifying expense, meaning that can be forgiven. Correct. So let's talk about sizing of the loan. Um, how, how do we determine the size of the loan? How much can we get? Right, so the, the uh, rough number is, uh, as you see on the screen, two and a half times the borrower's average monthly payroll costs for 2019. Uh, now, uh, there are some distinctions uh, in terms of seasonal employers uh, or folks that are uh, newly in business so that they may just be uh, evaluating uh, their payroll for the beginning of this year. But the lion's share of folks are gonna look at their average monthly payroll costs for uh, all of last year. Um, there is a, uh, an important limitation. Uh, it, it only applies to the first $100,000 earned by any employee. Uh, so uh, when you're putting spreadsheets together to try to make a determination, you'll have to put some sort of formula or cap in uh, to, to pull out income uh, that's over the $100,000 threshold, um, or you'll wind up with a, a figure that's uh, uh, not in line with uh, what's going to be eligible. Uh, the the two and a half times figure roughly, I mean, the the this is only going to be available for an eight-week period of time. And so, uh, you know, rough numbers, uh, the, the, the two times uh, figure will, will take care of those two months of payroll. Um, if if they're equal to what they were before, and then the 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 half of the two and a half uh, is essentially an approximation uh, for for what uh, what might fall into the other three categories. Uh, principally, we think lease payments for most folks, uh, mortgage interest, and utilities. Uh, and then uh, we get back to this uh, uh, issue of qualified sick leave wages and the qualified leave wages, uh, as Mark talked about before. Uh, not being eligible uh, as payroll costs for the purposes of, uh, of the loan forgiveness. So uh, that's a topic that we've essentially covered already. Larry, one question that's coming up, and maybe Mark, you can speak to this as well. The payroll costs, we, we talk about limited to the first $100,000. Uh, does And that's a salary. Do we also include both the employer, employer and employee portion of the of FICA when we're calculating no, the loan amount? That, that, no, the um, FICA is specifically excluded, um, as well as you know, Railroad Retirement Tax Act, as well as well as FUTA or federal unemployment taxes. Um, Thank you. And yeah, and also you know the the you know collection of any income tax you know on the source of the wages so chapters 21 22 and 24 of the code and correct me if i'm wrong but if we're able when if you have people that are entitled to bonus compensation commission all of that is averaged and included in the amount it's all it's all income correct it is. You, you take into consideration, you know, all salary, wage, commissions, um, 
any other type of similar compensation. Um, if you're a, you know, if you're a service employee, they also, if they say you're supposed to take into consideration the payment of cash tips or equivalents. So you're going to be probably ballparking that. Um, you also include the payment for um, vacation pay, you know, parental, family, medical, or sick leave. And this actually is um, the, you know, the sick leave or the other leave that is not um, required to be paid under the the uh, patient's first corona, you know, coronavirus act. So um, to the extent you otherwise would be eligible and required to pay it, you're also able to include that as part of your payroll costs. Um, you're also required, you're allowed to include um, any payments for group health care benefits, including insurance premiums, um, payment of any retirement benefits, and also the uh, payment of any state or local tax assessed on the compensation of employees. And just to clarify, the first $100,000 earned is referring to wages, not total comp. Correct. So if you have an employee that's making $120,000 annually, then you could you could include in your calculation an amount equal to what $100,000 would be annually. So whatever that amount would be. Right. Uh, that's how right. you calculate. You, you, you get don't a calculate credit. your Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, you'd get a your monthly the monthly amount would be you you'd be able to include eight point three thousand in your payroll costs. Um, so they you know a highly compensated individual someone over a hundred thousand um, dollars you still are able to take into consideration the first hundred thousand dollars in compensation paid to that highly compensated individual. So sounds great. So now let's get on to what's probably most important other than sizing the loan is how do we get forgiveness and what is what is included in uh, qualified expenses? Yes, I'd, I'd like to just uh, before uh, just really quickly yeah. uh, one that's okay one uh, one uh, just going back to who's eligible just quickly something that should be self-evident but uh, compensation of employees who who reside outside of the United States or uh, whose principal place of residence is outside of the U.S. Uh, do not qualify. Um, so that's um, something I wanted to mention. Uh, and then and then as we get into this section, I do want to point out that the law provides that uh, specifically with regard to forgiveness, uh, additional guidance is going to be issuing uh, within 30 days. Uh, and so we're hoping that it comes quicker rather than later. And if, uh, and if what the SBA has given us so far in terms of the application uh, is any indication, uh, hopefully they're on their way to getting that uh, as soon as possible, uh, because ultimately uh, com complete and total forgiveness is what is what the goal of the program is and what everyone who is a borrower uh, has as their goal. So uh, in a nutshell, you, you have to use these loan proceeds for uh, what are uh, deemed uh, uh, covered expenses uh, during the eight-week period that commences on the date that the loan is originated. So the date that you receive the money and then for eight weeks thereafter. Uh, we've talked about the categories again, payroll costs, rent, mortgage interest, and utilities. And then this guidance at the bottom of the screen is something that came out uh, again with the, the, the stuff that came from the SBA just with in conjunction with the application. So there is a feeling that um, uh, that not more than 25% of the loan proceeds can be used for non-payroll costs or those other categories. And as we, as I mentioned earlier, if you were at 100% employment for if your if your employment for this year matched what it did for last year, and I understand for many folks it won't, um, uh, the two and a half times essentially means that 80% of the money would go towards payroll, and then you could use the other 20% for uh, rent, uh, et cetera. Um, so the SBA's 25% is, is sort of in that ballpark. Uh, I know that there's a, uh, a fear um, that folks are going to take more money than they need, um, perhaps set it aside as a planning strategy just in case once the forgiveness rules come out, they realize that they might not quite meet them in the way that they uh, anticipated that they would, uh, and then essentially give the money back. Um, unfortunately, that ties the money up. Um, 
so that other folks can't get their hands on it. So to some degree, even though it may be uh, a smart strategy to ask for more and, and, and give it back at the end if you don't use it, um, just like people are being asked or compelled to stay at home for the greater good, uh, folks should, to some degree, take that into account uh, in terms of the numbers that they're looking for. Thanks, Larry. Um, one of the things uh, we've gotten a question uh, regarding whether rent includes equipment rental. And, you know, looking at the language, it it's not clear. It, it doesn't exclude it. Um, I think the intent is real estate rent, but there's there's no clarifying language at this time in the statute that would that would suggest that equipment rentals or equipment leasing would not be included in a qualifying expense. Mark, have you seen Mark or Larry? Have you guys seen anything to the contrary? No, I haven't seen anything. I mean, this is um, you know, again, this is this is one of these things where you know, for everyone out there who's ever reviewed any type of legislation before, I mean, typically, you know, Congress will take, you know, six months to a year to draft this type of legislation and we still have, you know, a, a boatload worth of questions and you know, typically the the interpretation, the regulations flowing out of it are, you know, two or three times the length of the initial act. And so, you know, in this case, you know, the CARES Act was drafted in less than a week, one week. And so there's um, there's just so much um, uncertainty in terms of, you know, how we're supposed to interpret what rent means, um, you know, in this case and other provisions that um, we're just kind of waiting on guidance from, you know, the Treasury, um, Department of Labor, um, as it comes out, and I expect it's just going to continue to drip out um, daily, um, daily and weekly as this thing, um, this basically this program matures. Yeah, and kind of going off what you were saying, Mark, and what you were saying, Larry. To me, it, it appears as though the most prudent thing to do is to be as reasonable as possible in in all of your um, uses of the funds and your requests for funds. Uh, with how much flexibility there currently is in the program because there hasn't, all these issues haven't been ironed out yet. It's something that the more reasonable you are, the more, the more of a case you're going to have for forgiveness. Um, so to the extent that whether rent is intended to uncover equipment leasing, if it doesn't exclude it and there's a reasonable interpretation, you're going to, as long as you're falling within the other parameters of the, of the guidance that is available, you're going to have a much stronger case for forgiveness than if you were to try and take advantage of it. Yes, and I just point so, out that, go ahead. No, go ahead, Larry. I was just going to say that uh, there's some guidance that came from the U.S. Senate Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Uh, it's called a Small Business Owner's Guide to the CARES Act. And again, we'll, we'll make that available. Uh, but it, it does talk about, uh, in terms of allowable use of loan proceeds, rent, and then it has a parenthetical, including rent under a lease agreement. Well, I, I <laughs> again, I mean, we, it, that there certainly is, and the statute says it as well, um, but I'm not sure why they would make any sort of distinction like that, but it, it seems to be additive uh, and not anything other, other than that. Um, so it, it certainly appears from the start that as, as Mike says, a reasonable argument can be made that something other than what we would think of as traditional rent for a premises, but rent in this case for equipment uh, should reasonably be covered. Thanks, Larry. So we, we have, so just kind of give us a recap. We have our loan at two and a half times our average monthly wages generally for the for 2019 calendar year 2019. Um, and then we, assuming we use the loan, the loan proceeds correctly, we're eligible for forgiveness. Is there any way to, I, I should rephrase that, Larry, can you take us through how that can be reduced, our amount of forgiveness can be reduced? Sure. Or Mark, whoever pref would prefer. Yeah, you want me to, you've been talking a lot, Larry, so I could you know, I could chime in. Thanks, Mark. So the, um, you know, at 
the end of the program, when the eight week period ends, um, you know, anyone, any eligible recipient of a paycheck protection program will, be, will be able to apply for forgiveness, um, of that loan amount. And the eligible amount that may be forgiven is actually, um, based on, based on, you know, a product of the amount of money that you've actually borrowed. Um, times a fraction, and the fraction consists where the the numerator, which is the top on the top, is that the that the average number of FTEs or full time employees um, that were employed during that eight week period, um, and um, or, you know, or it could be the you know over the average number of full time employees um, from February fifth to June thirtieth. So. Um, what happens is they, they, they take into consideration, well, um, if you had 50, well, I'll say this, if you have 100 employees today and you end up furloughing or discharging 50 of them um, tomorrow, then what happens is that, um, and, and provided you don't rehire them, if you'll, you'll only be allowed eligible to forgive 50% or, um, you know, 50, since you have 50 employees and you, but you had a hundred employees for the prior period. Um, so only 50% of the loan would be eligible for, to be forgiven. Um, but there is an exemption and we'll talk about this a little bit further, you know, further later in the seminar that, um, for any employees that you have, um, that, that have been, that have been discharged or have been furloughed, um, up until 30 days after the, CARES Act was signed by the president, so that would be April 26th. So long as you rehire them by June 30th um, of 2020, so if you rehire them on June 30th of 2020, um, you are not going to be penalized. Um, so the full amount would be eligible. So in the example I just gave, um, if you rehire the 50 employees that you let go tomorrow, so that you have 100 employees on June 30th, the full amount um, of the loan under the paycheck program would be eligible to be forgiven. Um, and um, the the other the other thing is we talked about um, that would be more of a RIF or reduction of force. The other thing that's available, a planning um, planning option that's available to employers today is that. Um, you're able to you're able to without penalty reduce the compensation of you know any employee making under a hundred thousand by um by twenty five percent without having that um you know reduce the amount of the loan forgiveness however, if you decided to reduce you know an employee making a hundred thousand to fifty thousand then um if you don't eliminate that reduction by June thirtieth um, then the twenty-five thousand um, dollars that that was reduced would be um, twenty-five thousand dollars would would reduce it would reduce the amount that would be eligible under the loan. The the question that we we have is what really do they mean by eliminate that reduction in salary? Does it mean that you have to go back and pay um, back pay to the employee, or does it just mean that? Um, as of June 30th, you know, you have to increase their pay from 50,000 back to 100,000 or um, back to 75,000. We don't know. That's more guidance that we'll be looking for. So, um, you know, in a nutshell, there's the, the, way that the, the way that you determine the amount of the loan that may be forgiven is you look at the average number of employees you, ha you know, had employed during that eight week period um, and add back the number that you rehired um, that were re the number of employees that were discharged before April 26th, but that you rehired by June 30th. And that's over the, um, the average number of employees that you had for uh, the, the prior year period from February 19th to June of 19th. Um, and then you also reduce, um, then you'd also reduce by any reductions in compensation by greater than 25%. Um, so, you know, one of the last bullet points, well, what about employees making um, highly compensated employees making over 100,000? Um, 
you can reduce their salary by as much as you want until you get down to $75,000. And so um, the minute you reduce them below 75,000, these rules kick in again. Um, thanks, Mark. One thing to keep in mind, um, cause we're getting a lot of questions about, can these funds be used to find it, to pay for previously financed equipment? Um, and things like that. Keep in mind that there's a 25% threshold also in the use of the funds. So over this eight week period, you're, you're going to get a, you're going to get a, a, an amount of money equal to two and a half times your average 2019 payroll. And you have, and the idea is that you are going to use that money, at least 75% of that money to pay payroll expenses for the eight, the eight or 10 week period from March one until June 30th. So, you know, there's some math to be done there, but if you try to wait until June 30th to remedy your payrolls, uh, you know, whether it be, be a increases in salary or increases in headcount, and then you try and, and you wait until June 30th to do that. And yet you've used that money for other expenses you're likely going to have a negative impact on your amount that can be forgiven considering the entire loan size was based on your previous year's average monthly payroll. Uh, Cause if you're, if you don't have the payroll to use those funds on, well, now you're using, now you're likely going to get above that 25% threshold to use, uh, use that money for other qualified expenses. So you need to keep that in mind as you know, we're getting a lot of questions about how else can I use this money? There is a tracking component that we're going to get to that you have to provide documentation and you're going to have to show that your payrolls are substantially similar. I believe that they said that there's going to be a de minimis exemption. Um, so if you're off by one or two employees, you may be all right. They haven't released what that de minimis exemption is going to be, but there is, there is a there is guidance out there that if you start using this money and you try to remedy at the last minute and try to you know somewhat game the system that you're not going to get the full forgiveness that you're seeking yeah i, th I think i'll just add in there i think um when you look at the sample application report and when you look at the this, um you know the the cares act itself it you know, what it does require you to do is to, as you know, as the applicant to certify that you're going to use the funds to retain workers, maintain pro payroll, and to use it for, you know, the purposes which are, you know, outlined in, you know, are outlined in this part of the, the act. So it's the payroll costs, it's the, um, your rent, your, your mortgage, your um, utilities. So, um, to that extent, I don't know how the compliance is going to work, and Mike kind of talked about it before, but I don't know how what lenders are going to do um, from a compliance standpoint to determine, you know, whether each um, borrower um, under the situation is complying with the use of those funds. So, um, you know, I always say that, you know, someone always, you know, someone always has the, you know, legally or not supposed to be using these funds for other purposes. However, you have the power to use them because those powers, you know, because you have the power over those funds and you can use those funds. So um, to that extent, I think the, you know, the one penalty for certain is that if you do use it for sources other than the um, permitted purposes under the, you know, under this program, um, it just, you know, would not be eligible to be forgiven. Um, which I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing based on the, um, you know, based on the cost, you know, the cost and the interest that's being charged on these loans. Um, so I'm not going to sit there and recommend and tell, you know, every one of my clients that they should go out and take these loans and use them for other purposes. But um, um, I, I can see where a lot of employers will be um, tempted to use them for, you know, other than payroll costs. Um, and otherwise so thanks mark uh there's an interesting question that just came through um and I, it's 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 very applicable to what we're talking about right now and the question is 2019 was a great year for a lot of companies they paid a lot of overtime and now this year obviously 
there's not going to be as much overtime. So, you know, they, they have a loan size. They don't have a loan sizing issue because they have plenty of uh, payroll expenses to get a loan. So two and a half times that amount. The question becomes, is that going, since there's going to be less overtime available now, is that going to, is that going to have an impact on the uh, forgivability of that loan? And the short answer is yes. Uh, when you're sizing your loan, the maximum amount you can get is two and a half times your average monthly payrolls or $10 million. But that doesn't mean you need to borrow the maximum amount. The, the question becomes, do you have enough other expenses that if you had a, if you had a lot of overtime in 2019, so your payroll expenses were higher than you would otherwise expect this year, well, do you have other expenses that you can use that money on? Would those, ex would your payroll have decreased by more than 25%? Um, and if the answer is yes, then you would want to reduce your loan size. Otherwise you're not going to have the entirety forgiven. Um, so next let's talk about how that uh, income or how that uh, indebtedness that's being forgiven is treated. Mark, you want to walk us through this? Sure. Um, you know, one of the other incentives for this program is that um, anybody who's um, been, you know, on the end of representing, um, you know, a company who's, you know, a debtor and has some debt forgiven or even yourself, if you've had some sort of debt relief in the past, um, typically what you would do is you get, um, you know, you get a information statement, um, you know, it's typically 1099 COD you know, from a lender that indicates that that um, the amount of the forgiveness would be considered um, cancellation in, of indebtedness income or COD income, um, which would mean that you'd have to take that into um, account and include it as your gross income on your, um, you know, the tax year in which it was forgiven. You know, under the CARES Act, it expressly says that um, any amounts that are forgiven, any amount of debts that are forgiven, um, are not going to be includable in, you know, the borrower's gross income. So that's a plus as well. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, and it's important to note that even, so this is principal forgiveness only. So there's still an interest component, which is at 0.5%, almost negligible, um, depending on your loan size. Um, and to the extent you let's say you don't get all the funds out, so you're not eligible for full forgiveness, you are able to prepay the loan without penalty, which is unique to this program because typically SBA loans have a prepayment component, prepayment penalty component to them. Um, you know, so it really does make this, you know, there's a lot of talk of this being somewhat free money. And to a large extent, it can be viewed that way. It almost functions as a grant um, due to this, but if you were to use the proceeds outside of allowable uses or covered covered expenses, you're still getting a loan at 0.5% interest. Now, Mark and Larry, correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't seen any guidance on you know prosecution it, abuse of this loan program at this point. Um, other than, I, I mean, I, I do believe there might be some perjury issues because you're certifying on a federal form that you're using it for these covered expenses. But do you guys want to uh, shed some light on that from your understandings? Uh, well, uh, this is well, Larry. Joking, but, jokingly, I don't have an understanding. So. <laughs> I, I, I will hmm. say that the... Uh, that the that the application form uh, includes a, a variety of uh, statutory references uh, uh, to folks who have been debar you know to folks that would not qualify in the first instance um, based on some sort of debarment or suspension um, from participating in federal programs. Uh, there is a as you see on the application, there is a uh, criminal background uh, check that will be done. Uh, so there, there, those, and these are the typical in a typical SBA loan or a 504 loan. Uh, there's nothing new about these provisions. They, they always exist. You are getting money ultimately that's guaranteed by the federal government. 
uh, and they can set the, the rules of play uh, as they see fit. Um, so, uh, you know, we certainly would, would, would caution folks that just as in any other time they'd be using federal dollars, uh, there are eyes watching you. Uh, and there is some reference to inspector generals and that sort of stuff. Um, there's gonna be a lot of money going out the door and uh, undoubtedly there will be, uh, to use the term waste, fraud and abuse, uh, you just wanna make sure it's not you or your client. Uh, I wanna offer a small disclaimer here that these squiggles on the side of the screen uh, are, that I'm realizing everyone has seen, I do not believe are mine and I would like to compliment the artist for putting them together. Um, anyway, sorry that they've, uh, that they've messed up our PowerPoint a little, but we are all learning about Zoom uh, in real time. Uh, well, we're on the, the, the topic of uh, talking about uh, other SBA loans or SBA loans in general. Uh, folks have uh, asked uh, if they're able to participate in some of the other federal assistance that's out there. Uh, the EIDL or the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, uh, which is really uh, designed mostly uh, for uh, natural disasters, um, was something that $50 billion were made available quickly uh, for. Uh, these are the loans that are SBA direct um, that folks apply online to the SBA. Uh, there has been some discussion about the system uh, crashing, uh, folks being able to get perhaps 80% 80, 80 through with the application. The good news is that that information is saved in the system, um, but you do wind up having to uh, start over in some measure. But in any event, uh, those uh, participation in that, as long as you're not spending money on the exact same uh, category of expense or the exact same expense, I should say, uh, you know, you, you can get you can get money from both pools of funds. Um, and then they ultimately, uh, although we'd like to see a little more guidance on it, can be refinanced and rolled into uh, uh, the uh, uh, PPP loans. Uh, so we also want to point out that traditional SBA products, the 7A, the 504 loan, uh, and uh, micro loans, um, again, if you're not duplicating the purpose, so you're not trying to get money for the exact same expense, uh, those programs still continue to exist, and uh, there are folks uh, making making those loans uh, as we speak. Um, so those programs, uh, again, don't don't preclude you uh, from participating in the PPP. Thanks, Larry. So now, um, Mark, and probably more, more Mark, um, can you kind of walk us through this interaction with some of the other programs that are out there right now? Sure. Um, there's another program under the CARES Act, which um, they they title it um, Employee Retention Credit. Um, and you know, under that program, what um, what an employer is eligible to do is receive a credit of you know up to five thousand per employee, or you know the equivalent of ten thousand in qualified wages um, um, for the period from you know March second, uh, March twelfth to twenty two. The end of the year, um, and the question is: Is you know, does, may an eligible employee receive both? Um, so they take advantage of the employee retention credit, um, and at the same time, um, be a borrower and um, use money you know that's um, lent under the Paycheck Protection Program. The answer is no. Um, the guidance has already been issued by the um, the IRS that. Um, you can't double dip. Um, an eligible employer may not receive the employee retention credit um, if they're also receiving a small business interruption loan um, under the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and um, just a little background on how that credit works. It kind of works similar to the um, qualified sick leave credit. Um, so what happens is um, you're allowed to offset or credit $5,000 against the um, the amount of payroll taxes, the um, social security taxes that you were otherwise eligible uh, required to deposit with the, the government. Thanks, Mark. 
Uh, and now uh, the interaction between the up, what they are calling phase one of the coronavirus response, which is the family's first coronavirus response act. We we've talked about this kind of in detail again, Mike. But you know, all this says is that um, to, the ex to the extent they are actually required to pay um, qualified sick leave, and this is more emergency leave that's relating to. Um, you know, an employee who actually is, um, you know, can diagnose with, um, you know, coronavirus um, or, you know, for someone who actually has to um, take leave to care for a family member to the extent that um, you're required as an employer to pay that type of leave under this program. And this, that's distinguished from, you know, what you, have, you know, the other leave that you'd, you know, be required to pay for, you know, you're, you're able to get a credit um, against your payrolls get you know under the family's first act um and to the extent that you do that um you you know you still are able to um you still are able to have a loan an sba um small business interruption loan it's just like i said before these wages that um and these these wages that are paid are not actually eligible to be considered payroll costs for the purposes of receiving loan forgiveness so you know, in the event that you use 10,000 of those borrowed funds to pay um, sick pay, that 10,000 would not be forgivable um, if it was relating to, you know, leave wages for an employee who um, was caring for, you know, a family member who came down with uh, coronavirus. Um, and just last night, I think I said earlier, the IRS actually issued guidance on how to apply for those refunds of tax credits. And um, I have not looked at that form in any level of details other than um, I would imagine it's um, uh, you know, a nice form with five or six pages worth of instructions. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll be looking at that and I'll provide some more guidance um, later on. Thanks, Mark. Um, our next slide, we, we talked about this already in pretty good detail about the, uh, the deferral of payroll taxes or certain payroll taxes. Um, so I, I think we can leave it at that unless Mark or Larry, you think there's anything we need to add from our pre that we missed in our earlier conversation. Yeah. The, the only questions that I mean, I think there's some, the questions that I have out there regarding it is that um, whether you're able to defer, you know, the you know, defer depositing the employer's section of the payroll taxes when you do have a, you know, a small business loan under the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, my, my guess is the guidance is going to say no, but then, you know, the question is what about the, you know, what about giving employers a credit for the amount, you know, that they are required to pay, you know, for highly compensated individuals. Are they eligible to, um, you know, does, does that kick in? Are you able to defer that portion? So um, my guess is they're probably going to do a flat denial and say, if you've got a small business interruption loan, um, you're not eligible to participate in the um, this part of the CARES Act, which allows you to defer the payment um, deposit of the employer side FICA taxes. Thanks, Mark. Um, so looking at time, we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, so I, I think this will kind of come into what do what do borrowers need to know? Um, Larry, you want to kind of walk through this? Sure. So the uh, admonition to uh, apply early uh, has certainly been heeded by folks. Uh, as I say, there was a, a, a telephone conference that Mayor Barrett was on with a number of bankers, uh, at least in the well, at a minimum in the Milwaukee area uh, uh, within the last couple of days. And their general feeling uh, is that the funds will all be spoken for uh, perhaps within as short as a 10 day period. So the first come first served concept uh, really applies. Uh, as we indicated earlier, you should, you, should, you should seek out an SBA lender who's already authorized, not someone who's waiting to be deputized by uh, the FDIC uh, to do this because uh, that process may take uh, too long um, and there may not really be much available at that point uh, to go for. Uh, again, there are limited funds available. 
even though one would never think that $350 billion would be viewed as limited. Uh, a, a, a caution, uh, although we think there shouldn't be much of an issue, uh, is that those with existing uh, loans um, should check their covenants, uh, which will oftentimes, most times, have prohibitions against uh, additional debt uh, since ultimately this is going to be viewed as something that's positive for the business. And since it has no collateral associated with it, there are no guarantees, uh, there, there, there are no mortgages or security agreements associated with it. Um, it it's not as though uh, an existing lender's collateral will be, uh, will be compromised in any way, uh, even though those liens would be junior to their liens, but they don't want those types of liens coming on ordinarily in any event. So there won't be any, so that's good. And then ultimately the policy argument is that uh, if this is going to be forgivable and other than the half, uh, half uh, percent uh, interest that's chargeable on it, which is awfully nominal, uh, that this is gonna have uh, no negative impact on the borrower. And in fact, is going to have a tremendous benefit uh, to their borrower. Um, so we generally feel that that ought not to be a problem, um, but we do caution folks to take a look uh, you may in fact be dealing with your principal lender. Um, and so you'll be talking about this issue uh, with them in the first instance. So not likely to be a big problem. Um, and then tracking as we talked about uh, is going to be uh, really imperative. Um, and again, we're looking for the further guidance that'll be uh, coming out uh, specifically on the forgiveness portion. Uh, what's essentially gonna happen is uh, after June 30th, uh, folks will be able to uh, put an application in for forgiveness to their lender. Uh, the lender is going to have six, up to 60 days to, re to review that um, and then to make a determination uh, based on what they've seen as to uh, how much of the loan is forgivable. And again, we do expect some further guidance on this, but folks should recognize that we're talking about the period from, you know, we're talking about July and August at that point in terms of the review. Um, so certainly we'll know far in advance of that uh, what sorts of things uh, folks are going to have to provide um, in order to be able to get uh, full forgiveness. Well, while we're on that subject, I, I, we want to talk about uh, the lender's perspective on this as well. Um, lenders, uh, the typical SBA loan uh, guarantees 75% or in some instances 85% of the loan. Uh, in this case, it will be 100% guarantee. Uh, and the way that the lenders uh, will, will get that money, they're gonna be required to use their own money from the start um, as they would in any typical SBA deal. Uh, since there's a deferral of interest uh, or any payments, but essentially, um, well, deferral of, of all payments um, for at least the first six months, although the act says it could be up to a year, but for the first six months, uh, they have to be in a position where they have uh, the ability to commit resources to this uh, and not get anything back for uh, that first period of time. And then there'll be the forgiveness period uh, determination. And then after that, there still is another 120 day period where the SBA will uh, ultimately, well, they'll, they'll submit to collect a, in effect on the guarantee uh, and get their money back. So uh, lending institutions need to be prepared to live without that money or any money uh, coming in off of that money for uh, essentially uh, maybe up to 10 months. Uh, there are no guarantee fees involved, which there usually are with SBA deals. So that's a great savings. Uh, there will be a need uh, to verify, as we say here, borrowers operations and their monthly payroll costs. Uh, going to, I guess, my first point about living without the money, these loans can still, as with most SBA loans, if you're set up to do it, be sold uh, on the secondary market. Um, ordinarily, a lender can sell the guaranteed portion of the loan, and then they would retain the non-guaranteed portion. So in the normal circumstance, they'd sell the 75% guaranteed portion, keep the 25. Uh, in this instance, they'll be able to sell 100% off uh, in the secondary market, again, if they're set up to do that. Um, and then the uh, concept of processing fees is, is, is interesting. Um, lenders, there's an indication in the guidance from the SBA in the lender information sheet that loans 350,000 and under uh, will be eligible for a 5% processing fee. So that's 17,500 on the full 350. 
uh, greater than 350 and less than 2 million, a 3% fee. And then over that, uh, uh, over 2 million, a 1% fee. Uh, they're not allowed to collect any of those fees from the applicant. Um, they'll be paid by the, uh, the SBA ultimately. And importantly, uh, agent fees uh, will be able to be paid out of that, uh, out of that lender fee. So there is in a typical SBA deal, uh, a form uh, called the fee disclosure form and compensation agreement. And uh, it, it provides uh, that essentially folks that help borrowers to package loans uh, or to, to put their application together uh, or, or for a variety of other categories um, for servicing, for environmental professionals that are involved uh, and sometimes uh, real estate commissions and that sort of thing uh, that, that they have to disclose uh, any fee that they've paid to anyone uh, at all. And if the amount exceeds $2,500, then it requires uh, that, the, that there be more of a breakout in terms of hourly rate, number of hours billed, et cetera. Um, in the ordinary circumstance, they're trying to make sure that there aren't folks that are out there saying, I can get you great money through the SBA. All you have to do is pay me $30,000 to do it and um, we'll get you all taken care of. Uh, in this circumstance, uh, the guidance uh, indicates, and I think quite helpfully so, that these agents uh, can be an attorney, uh, an accountant, a consultant, uh, again, application preparers, uh, folks that help the lenders uh, with originating, dispersing, uh, servicing, liquidating, uh, and litigating SBA loans, uh, which is interesting, uh, loan brokers, and uh, other individuals uh, or entities representing an applicant uh, conducting business. Excuse me, sorry about that. <laughs> I think. Uh, so yeah. I think I'll kind of pick up here, Mike. Um, I think, yeah. you know, we're, we're kind of near the end of it. And one of the things that I thought would be important to talk about is just, you know, what's going on um, in our practice today? What type of, um, you know, what are we really, um, how are we really advising our clients and what type of issues are coming up? And so the, the key concerns and the key analysis that we're doing today is that, um, you know, we, we'd love to have a crystal ball and be able to project where, you know, our businesses are going to be on June 30th of this year, um, but we just don't know. And so the, the questions that we're, you know, looking into right now and, um, you know, before is, um, does it make sense to, to, um, you know, complete a reduction in force now? Um, does it make sense to um, reduce salary as part of a plan, um, you know, for the next year and not just for the next two months, because, and arguably this program just does kick the can down the road another eight weeks and is going to make, um, you know, unless this thing is extended further, is going to make um, tough decisions um, that need to be made, um, you know, delayed for eight weeks. And so, you know, these are the type of um, questions that we're taking into consideration, um, particularly because if we, if we do do, a, you know, execute a reduction in force today, if we do reduce the salary, um, by April 26th, um, to the extent they're able to rehire them on June 20, June 29th, June 30th, um, that's not going to affect the amount that's eligible for forgiving, um, at least based on our interpretation of this loan. Um, so we're, we're trying to balance the economics and the planning um, and the budgeting in terms of where, you know, where our businesses might be in June um, versus, you know, kind of where there's a lot of discussion out there, um, you know, you know, you know, on, on social media, Mark Cuban for one says that um, employers are going to be judged by how they treat their employees, um, you know, during this this pandemic period, which I which I completely agree with. Um, but um, at the same time, you actually have to have a company um, at the end of this period, um, whether it's eight weeks from now or three months from now or six months from now, and you need to start planning, um, you know, what is the best structure? Um, you know, what is, what is the headcount? What is the efficiency of the employment um, that you foresee that you're going to need, you know, 
in two months and six months because um, I'm hard pressed to think that, you know, companies, you know, I've got some companies that are down 90%, um, in 90% to 100% um, who, um, you know, I, I doubt that they're going to be back up to 100% um, in, in June, at the end of June or in July. So, um, you know, the question is what, you know, what do we do today? How do we plan today? Um, for the, um, you know, to make the company successful in the future. And those are the tough decisions that are being made today. So um, to that extent, um, you know, this, this act, this, you know, the CARES Act, which the incentive was to keep people on the payroll, um, this exemption for rehires, I don't think it necessarily does that. Um, I think it may um, encourage the other purpose um, because, um, like I said, you're, you're making the decision you're trying to forecast where you are eight weeks down the road. Um, and, you know, are you going to be able to, if this isn't, if this, you know, if this loan isn't extended and the economy hasn't recovered or your business hasn't, um, um, hasn't recovered to, you know, any type of, you know, what we call, you know, substantial capacity where you're at before, then you're going to have to make decisions eight weeks from now. Um, so, you know, does it make more sense to discharge employees today um, to do a salary reduction today versus um, wait eight weeks? Um, there's some hard decisions that are being made. So, um, I, I know Mark. what your scenario has been, uh, Mike or, or Larry, but that's kind of what I've been dealing with. Yeah, um, just to kind of, we're coming up on time, and I think Mark made some very good points there. Um, you know, the, the way that this language is drafted allows for flexibility. Um, you know, you can reduce payrolls up to 25% and still qualify for forgiveness, which the idea is that an employee still receiving 75% of their salary is better than an employee receiving none of their salary. Um, so the idea, the idea behind it is to keep people employed for as long as possible rather than being on the unemployment rolls. Um, just to kind of summarize again in the couple of minutes we have, eligibility is generally any business under 500 individuals, uh, under 500 employees, unless you fall into that accommodations or uh, hospitality category, um, in which case it's 500 employees per location. Um, the maximum amount you can borrow is the average monthly salary or payroll costs, you know, that all encompassing term from 2019. So you take that, that should help smooth out fluctuations on, you know, ramping up and hiring people, you know, towards the end of 2019, if your payroll fluctuated over the year, you take the average monthly cost, you take your total payroll costs from 2019 divided by 12, multiply that by two and a half, 2.5. That's the maximum amount you can borrow. You do not have to borrow the maximum amount. Um, the, so the other thing is when you're count, figuring out your head count for the covered period, the amount of people, the, the force you have to be in order to maximize your forgiveness, that date starts on two, as of 2.15 of 2020. So th those are some of the bigger questions we were getting is what period counts? Um, do you have to be a, do you have to have lost business? Well, yes and no. You'll see in the, at the end of our slides, we have a number of things put out by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, lenders aren't necessarily looking for whether you've lost business, but they're looking for uncertainty of economic conditions makes the loan request necessary to support ongoing operations. So if you're an essential business and you're still able to operate, that you can still qualify for this. Um, especially if let's say you're a restaurant, you're technically an essential business. You just can't have people in your, in your dining rooms. So at that point you need to, you, you still qualify because you need additional funds to keep your, your, your head count up. So there's a lot of nuances to this. Um, you know, I would encourage you guys to talk to your lender, talk to your attorneys, talk to your advisors. Um, there's a ton of guidance still coming out. But unfortunately, like Larry and Mark and I have all pointed out, this is a very fast moving program that unfortunately doesn't have the funds to last for a long period of time for us to kind of figure this out. Um, so with that, Larry, do you have any closing remarks you want to make? 
Uh, no, I really, I just wanted to thank everybody. Uh, we've had a, a terrific uh, a response to getting this together and, and we, we would like to thank the <clears throat> different players that are involved in this. We've been talking to folks on all sides of the equation uh, in terms of lenders and borrowers. And in fact, uh, lenders may themselves be borrowers in this circumstance. Um, and so, uh, you know, please, please look for, for further guidance. Uh, we've been uh, aggressively trying to uh, push information out just as soon as we have it. Um, and whether it's from us or for, from other trusted resources, um, things are changing very quickly. And uh, I would just caution folks to, uh, even though they're moving quickly, to uh, try to move as carefully as possible. And uh, I'll, I'll just answer one more question I see out there. Mike is, um, question is for clarification, um, their staff is hired through uh, staffing services. So that would um, likely be, you know, temp agencies, et cetera. Yes, that, that does, you know, that would fall within the, the least employee provision. So yes, um, you would um, you'd still be eligible for um, this because you do have payroll. You are paying compensation to employees. Um, the employees are just least employees. And yes, um, that, that would be eligible for forgiveness as long as it's being paid, um, you know, for payroll. Thanks, Mark. Um, Paget, should we hand this over to you? That concludes our session. If you've got any additional questions, please reach out to any of our speakers as noted there on the screen. Um, as mentioned earlier, this has been recorded and will be posted to our website um, within 24 hours, um, the, both the recording and also the PowerPoint, and we will forward it to you directly as well. Thanks so much and have a good afternoon. Thanks all.